So coming to the congenital and developmental defects. So this is the topic that we are discussing today. So what are congenital defects? This we should know first and foremost. Congenital defects are those defects that occur prior to birth and they are usually more severe. And developmental defects are those defects that occur between birth and final fusion. So, and these defects can be caused by environmental as well as genetic factors plus idiopathic causes also. So, first and foremost, you should know the difference. What is congenital? What is developmental? So, coming to congenital disease, also known as congenital disorder, it can be defined as a structural or functional anomaly, including metabolic disorders. Those are existing at birth and often before birth means intrauterine or that develops during the first month of life, means the neonatal time, the neonatal disease that the patient, that the child is developing. So we are including everything like obviously the intrauterine time and the delivery time and then one month after that. Congenital disorders vary widely in causation and abnormalities because the developmental, these disorders, they some, like you can say it is superimposing on the congenital disease. And any substance that causes birth defects is known as a teratogen. So you, should, you have to be aware about all the teratogens. Some disorders can be detected before birth through prenatal diagnosis screening, but not all developmental disorders can be, all these disorders can be detected. So coming to the etiology. So congenital defects basically we divide into two, like genetic and non-genetic. So genetic, we have single gene pathology. We have multiple gene pathology. We have chromosomal abnormalities. Non-genetic, we have teratogenic, idiopathic, and there are most common congenital anomalies. However, show the family patterns expected of multifactorial inheritance that is determined by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. So this is the most common that has been seen in the fetuses or the newborn children. So it is multifactorial. This you have to note because not one factor determines it. Coming to the incidence and prevalence, 3% of all live-born infants have an obvious major anomaly because usually the uh, like the intrauterine, they are conceiving. In that case, many like 90% of the time, it is diagnosed intrauterine and those pregnancies are terminated. In 10% of the cases, these pre pregnancies keep on going till delivery. And out of that, these 3% of all live-born infants have an obvious major anomaly. Some have IUDs also, intrauterine death also. The incidence is about 6% in 2-year-olds. So it is increasing at 2-year-old and 8% in 5-year-olds. Means many of the anomaly is not being diagnosed at the time of birth because India doesn't have that much outreach towards health sector. So, and plus parents are not aware. If there is awareness also, there is lack of acceptance. So obviously it will take time. And so 6% is diagnosed in two years and 8% in five-year-old. So coming to the pathophysiology, during the first two weeks of development, usually teratogenic edges kill the embryo or have no effect. So if you have been like exposed to a teratogenic agent, so in the first two weeks of development, either you will have an intrauterine there, means the embryo will not progress further or it will have no effect, means the pregnancy is continuing further. So during the organogenesis period means third to eight weeks, these teratogenic agents disrupt development and may cause major congenital anomalies. During the fetal period, that is ninth week to ninth month, teratogens may produce morphological and functional abnormalities, particularly of the brain and eyes. So this is very important because this is the way you have to see because when you're taking a history, many times a patient comes to you and say that, okay, say maybe I have taken chloroquine during this time. So you need to know when you have to keep the pregnancy and when you have to go for abortion, what tests you have to do. The genetic factors leading to congenital anomalies may be due to chromosomal anomalies. There may be gene mutations or it may be multifactorial. Chromosomal abnormalities occur due to late maternal age at the time of pregnancy leads to chromosomal non-disjunction. So it is very important because the patient will come and ask you many times the karyotype is normal. Then they will ask you that how come there is defect in the child. Then you have to explain that it is also due to gene mutation or it is due to multifactorial causes. There may be history of radiation exposure which causes chromosome deletions, translocations or breaks. Viruses such as German measles, autoimmune diseases and some chemical agents which has act as antimitotic drugs. 
So chromosomal abnormalities are classified into numerical and structural defects. Numerical chromosomal anomalies are divided into like polyploidy or triploidy, like a fetus is having 69 chromosomes, tetraploidy, where the fetus has 92 chromosomes. So these kind of fetuses, when you send it for like retained products of conception, when you send it for testing, then that time you will have some defect. Other times it is normal. So there is no defect because it is not numerical. Polyploidy leads to severe congenital anomalies and early abortion. Aneuploidy, what is called aneuploidy, when there are one or more chromosomes is added or missed, as in Down syndrome, which one must have commonly read about, that is trisomy 21. Turner syndrome is just 45X or a female missing 1X. And Klinefelter syndrome, 47XSY or a male person with an extra X chromosome. Structural chromosomal anomalies including chromosomal deletion, duplication, translocation, inversion, ring and isotranslocation, inversion and ring and isochromosomes. It may also lead to severe chromosome defects. It may also lead to severe congenital anomalies or fetal death. It is not that all fetuses with this kind of problem, they die. They also do deliver. So coming to the toxic substances. So drug use during pregnancy can have temporary or permanent effects on the fetus. Substances whose toxicity can cause congenital disorders are called teratogens and include certain pharmaceutical and recreational drugs in pregnancy, as well as many environmental toxins in pregnancy. The human embryo or fetus is relatively susceptible to impact from adverse conditions within the mother's environment. So one must be aware about all the category of drugs, category A, B, C, D, category X. So only category A drugs are like permitted in pregnancy. Other category drugs are banned during pregnancy. So you have to be very particular when you are giving antibiotics to the patient or any other drug to the patient. Now coming to infection. A vertically transmitted infection is an infection caused by bacteria, viruses, or in rare cases, parasites transmitted directly from the mother to an embryo, fetus, or baby during pregnancy or childbirth. It can occur when the mother gets an infection as an intercurrent disease in pregnancy. Nutritional deficiencies may exacerbate the risk of perinatal infection. Then coming to lack of nutrition. Nutrition is also very important. Females who are having anorexia nervosa, bulimia, right now they follow so many diet habit changes. So they should know about it. Nutrition and pregnancy refers to the nutrient intake and dietary planning that is undertaken before, during and after pregnancy. So before is also very important. They not only have physical disorders have been linked with poor nutrition before and during pregnancy, but neurological disorders and handicaps are a risk that is run by mothers who are malnourished, a condition which can also lead to the child becoming more susceptible to later degenerative diseases. So 23.8% of babies are estimated to be born with lower than optimal weights at birth due to lack of proper nutrition. Coming to physical restraint, external physical shocks or constrainment due to growth in a restricted space may result in unintended deformation or separation of cellular structures resulting in an abnormal final shape or damaged structures unable to function as expected. An example is Potter syndrome due to oligohydronics. Coming to genetic causes, this I have already explained. There are single gene defects, multiple gene disorders, chromosomal defects. So single gene defects may arise from abnormalities of both copies of an autosomal gene. That is a recessive disorder or of only one of the two copies, like a dominant disorder. So if you have this, both copies of an autosomal gene, then you are having a recessive problem in the child. But if you're having only one of the two copies, then you're having a dominant disorder. Some conditions result from deletions or abnormalities of a few genes located conspicuously on a chromosome. This is very important, this recessive and dominant, because many times patient will come to you for preconception counseling. In that, they already know that they have a defect. So like they have a defect, they know it. So they will ask you chances that what are the chances of they having the same baby, same kind of baby as they are, or they are going to have some baby which is incompatible with life. So then you have to comment on this. Chromosomal disorders involve the loss or duplication of larger portions of a chromosome or an entire chromosome containing hundreds of genes. Large chromosomal abnormalities always produce effects on many different body parts and organ systems. 
So coming to the maternal age, it is known that mongolism is more common in babies born to mothers who approach menopause. So this is just a study. In the newborn ward of Dr. Sipto Magnusmo Hospital in 1975-1979, it is such an old study because nowadays what happens, these kind of babies are not born. Or patients with advanced maternal age, they go for PGT. So I have included a very old study in this. They found clinically that the incidence of mongolism is 1.08 per 100 live births and found a relative risk of 26.93 for groups of women in 35 years old or more. So you see, in patients with more than 45 years or old, it is 1 is to 15. Now this is not there because with the advent of IV fertility things, we are doing PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing on those embryos. So there is no risk of this kind of problem, which was present earlier. So coming to the hormonal factors, hormonal factors also alleged to have a relationship with the incidence of congenital abnormalities. Babies born to mothers with maternal hypothyroidism or diabetes mellitus are likely to experience greater growth disorders when compared to normal infants. Plus, there are unknown multifactorial causes. Although significant progress has been made in identifying the etiology of some birth defects, approximately 65% have no known or identifiable cause. So you see, this is a huge number, 65%. These are referred to as sporadic, a term that implies an unknown cause, random occurrence, regardless of maternal living conditions, and a low recurrence risk for future children. For 20 to 25% of anomalies, there seems to be a multifactorial cause, meaning a complex interaction of multiple minor genetic anomalies with environmental risk factors. Another 10 to 13% of anomalies have a purely environmental cause. For example, infections, illness, drug abuse in the mother. Only 12 to 25% of anomalies have a purely genetic cause. Of these, the majority are chromosomal anomalies. So you see the, the problems that are related to genetics is only 12 to 25%. And 10 to 13% we can easily rule out because that is in our hand. It is related to infection, illness or drug abuse. That you can easily rule out. So 20 to 25% multifactorial, we can't do much. We only need to reduce the risk. But main focus should be on this 10 to 13% and 12 to 25%. Plus there is obviously the role of radiation. You all must have heard about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and everybody must be aware that uh, obviously like for cancer survival patients, we tell them to uh, freeze their gametes before their dose of chemotherapy or radiotherapy starts. So this is just to reduce the radiation risk and to preserve their eggs and the sperms. So now giving it a crux, a summarizing it. So what are the environmental factors? Infectious agents. These agents include a number of viruses. That is rubella. Rubella is a major problem because it causes cataract, glaucoma, heart defect, heart defects, and deafness in the in the newborn child. So it is very important that you do all your rubella testing beforehand. If the patient is, doesn't have an IgG, means the immunity is not developed in the female patient, always give a rubella vaccine, wait for three to six months, then tell the patient to conceive. Cytomegalovirus, we can do a torch test, obviously. The infection is often fatal, and if not meningoencephalitis produced, it produces mental retardation. If we have herpes, sickplex, varicella, and human immunodeficiency, viruses are other examples. Because HIV, we can rule out when we are doing IVF cycles because in that there is no risk of HIV in the child. But other, if the patient is having herpes simplex and varicella, we need to monitor with the IgG and IgM titers. Then we have toxoplasmosis, same we do with TORCH. Syphilis, we are doing VDRLs. This leads to congenital deafness and mental retardation. Toxoplasmosis also leads to all these IUDs, miscarriages and mental retardation. So ionizing radiation, as I told you, it, it can lead to microcephaly, spina bifida, cleft palate. Chemical agents, as I discussed earlier, say like thalidomide, it is an anti nauseant sleeping pill. It produces milk, uh, limb defects, focomolia, it is the commonest limb defect, and heart malformations. Diphenyl hydantoin produce facial defects and mental retardation. It is commonly used in epilepsy. So if a patient is coming to you with any neurological, psychological problems, you need to show refer them to a neurologist so that they can change their medications when the patient is of preconception time or during her conception period. Tetracycline, it causes bone and teeth anomalies. Aspirin, it also causes harm in large doses. Cocaine, so coming to drug abuse. Cocaine causes birth defect possibly to its effect as a vasoconstrictor that causes hypoxia. So cocaine will lead to birth asphyxia. It will be fetal hypoxia. 
so the fetus will not grow naturally because it has less amount of oxygen coming inside it. Alcohol also causes fetal alcohol syndrome. It is very common because the females come and ask in the OPD, why should they quit alcohol if the male is drinking? So I always tell them, please quit because that is going to cause a fetal anomaly because the male is not carrying the baby. Androgenic agents like synthetic progestin to prevent abortion. Many times these are given. These also cause masculinization of the genitalia of female embryo, which is very common right, right now these days because progestins are given to patients because females are of advanced maternal age. So they are given. So uh, these drugs have to be given in a controlled form. Endocrine hormones as diethylestilbestrols cause mild formation of the uterus, uterine tube, upper vagina, vaginal cancer, and malformed testis. Cortisone, if also given in large doses, this also causes cleft palate. So the maternal diseases like diabetes causes variety of malformations as heart and neural tube defects. So if the female is diabetic, because there are a lot of type 1 diabetes right now who are going towards the reproductive age group, they are leading a fit and fab life because of the medical like advances that have happened. So in those patients, you have to be on the vigil to rule out all this. Your HbA1c has to be on control. Otherwise, the fetus will have all these heart and neural tube defects. If there's nutritional deficiency, particularly vitamins deficiency, then also they have, as discussed in the previous slide, they'll have anomalies and defects. Heavy metals, for example, organic mercury, it also predisposes you to all sorts of blindness, deafness.